I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we discuss the Russian missile strike on a shopping mall in Kremenchuk in the centre of Ukraine. Our Brussels correspondent, Joe Barnes, is on the ground in Madrid for the NATO conference. And we analyse remarks from the head of the British Army, who has likened the country's current defence situation to the lead-up to the Second World War, warning Britain is facing its 1937 moment. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Tuesday, the 28th of June, day 125. And today I'm joined by our Brussels correspondent, Joe Barnes, and assistant comment editor, Francis Dernley. Before we speak about the attack in Kremenchuk, here's a brief update on the situation in the rest of Ukraine and Europe. In the Donbass, Russian officials have said that street battles are now being fought in and around Lysychansk, after Russian soldiers completed their capture of the neighbouring town of Severodonetsk over the weekend. On Monday night, NATO pledged to increase forces available on high alert to more than 300,000 troops. The G7 have agreed to explore imposing a ban on transporting Russian oil that has been sold above a certain price, aiming to hit Russian President Vladimir Putin's war chest. An oil price cap would ratchet up existing Western pressure on Russia from sanctions, which German Chancellor Olaf Scholz insisted would stay until Putin accepted failure in Ukraine. Also at the G7, French President Emmanuel Macron said that Russia's strike this week on a Ukrainian shopping mall was a war crime, and that France would keep supporting Ukraine for as long as necessary. To quote Macron, Russia cannot, and must not, win this war. Elsewhere, grain prices have rebounded as concerns about the outlook for US crop production compounded the disruption caused by the invasion of Ukraine. And finally, Russian-affiliated hacker group Killnet claims to have cut off 70% of Lithuania's internet infrastructure in 39 hours. Just a final note for listeners, NATO might be the most powerful military alliance in history, but unfortunately, the Wi-Fi connection at their summit isn't the best, so Joe Barnes's call might be a little scratchy. Our apologies. I started by asking Francis Sternley about yesterday's strike on a shopping mall in Kremendruk. Yes, well, thank you, David. Uh, many of the, our listeners will, of course, already be aware of the horrific images that are coming out of Ukraine, uh, where we see an attack on a shopping centre where, according to President Zelensky, as many as a thousand people um, were happily doing their shopping when uh, they came under attack. And um, the death toll from this strike is has already risen from, I think it was 13 yesterday to 18 today, with 59 wounded. Um, it's, I know that Joe will want to talk about the international reaction to this, which of course has been considerable, not only in the context of the G7, but also um, around the world. Um, the Russians have claimed that this was uh, a depot, and I'm quoting here, a depot with weapons and ammunition from the USA and U- European countries in the vicinity um, of uh, a, a, the, an automobile, automobile factory. The explosions of ammunition for Western weapons sparked a fire in a nearby shopping mall, which was not operational at the time. Well, clearly, um, from what we can uh, divulge, that is not true, given that there have been already so many people that have been killed. Um, And of course, the questions being asked are, why have the Russians done this? Is this another example of, um, you know, of which we know there have been instances of just inaccuracy of weapons when this is kind of indiscriminate weapons fire, that this is an accident? Or is it something more chilling than that, effectively, uh, an attempt by Russia to show that it won't be cowed by uh, the G7 and the condemnation that's taken place of Russia there, that effectively it, it will continue to operate this war in any manner that it sees fit and, and as brutal as, as, as it likes in order to achieve those aims. And also perhaps sending a, a mission, uh, sorry, forgive me, uh, sending a, a clear signal about its operational capacity. Um, given the location of, uh, of this in Kremenchuk, um, it, this is not, you know, directly on the front line. Um, and so it's just like the strikes on Kiev that we saw with the beginning of the G7. I think this is Russia potentially trying to signal that this war is far from over. 
And Francis, yesterday we, we spoke about this attack and um, I believe it was Don made the point that these sorts of incredibly um, deadly strikes are occurring just at moments when there are big international summits or important foreign delegations are visiting Kiev. And, and as you said, it's the potential for it being a, a tactic is, is a high one. But, I mean, my question to you is... Do, Considering the amount of condemnation, is is it a failure, right? Like, if if everybody condemns it, surely surely this will make them uh, more firmer in their resolve. I think that's certainly true. I mean, the, whenever you see indiscriminate attacks like this in war, it hardens the resolve of of those who are defending. I mean, they're far less likely to surrender to, to the people who've committed these kind of acts. I mean, of course, the, the classic example, I know it's the most often cited one, but I think it, it speaks volumes, is uh, during the Blitz in the Second World War here in London and, and around the rest of the country, um, the, the, the feeling was this would d- demolish morale. Um, that was not the case. And I think it's also worth saying as well that with bomber commands attacks on Germany, the evidence is that that did not um, uh, lower morale either, but it did lower operational capacity of Germany. Um, uh, in, in, given the, the you know the bombings raids taking place in in, in various parts of that country. Um, that were had you know factories in and, and the like. Not everywhere that was bombed by Allied commanders, I should say, were 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 targets purely for that purpose but even so that that was true um so i i mean to your to, to your point i mean i think that yes that it is a miscalculation when measured on those terms but if it is being seen as i say more in terms of showing russian resolve showing uh, its military capacity then i think it can be seen slightly differently i think also as well we it's we need to avoid slipping into the mistake of seeing the war through western eyes and assuming that russia sort of understands the war in those terms. And what I mean by that is um, what information is is Putin seeing when this information slides across his desk? You know, perhaps he is hearing only the official line that this was an attack on a, a weapons depot nearby and this is sort of collateral damage. We, of course, don't see it in that way. We see this as a deliberate and conscious attack and certainly President Zelensky does as well, given his remarks, I'm sure Joe will go into. Um but yes, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, he, he we, we, it's dangerous for us to to assume too much that he is actually receiving accurate information as to what certain Russian um, uh, what, what certain commanders are are doing. I'm, I'm not saying we should be um, let him off the hook for that, but I'm purely saying that I don't think we can necessarily see this in, in, in terms of only this is an atrocity that has been committed there and the Russians know that this is an atrocity that's committed been committed and why because i think that's that's taking perhaps one too logical step forward which which may not quite be the case thanks francis i know um our brussels correspondent joe barnes is just heading through the security in nato summit so he should be joining us shortly so before that um francis can we talk about this this was the front page of the daily telegraph yesterday um some domestic news but i think uh, it's very important to think about and talk about how Ukraine has impinged on this. The head of the British Army um, has likened the country's current defence situation uh, to the lead up to the Second World War. Uh, He says that Britain is facing its 1937 moment. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What what does he mean? What what happened in 1937? Well, there's so much to unpack here, David, um, that that, um, I think we'll we'll have to spend a few few minutes on various aspects of this fascinating speech, as you say, by the Chief of the Defence Staff, General Sir Patrick Sanders, who's about to take over as the um, head of the British Army. So he refers to 1937 and he says that, and I quote, Britain must be ready to fight and win uh, uh, to, to ward off the threat from Russia. He says that this is our 1937 moment. We are not at war, but must act rapidly so that we aren't drawn into one through a failure to contain territorial expansion. So you ask about what he means by 1937. Well, there is your answer. He's essentially saying from his understanding of, of what occurred in the late 1930s, that war could have been prevented were it not for, um, for a sort of an appeasement policy, which let Hitler get away with seizing territory, um, further instances of ter- territory, you know, Czechoslovakia, parts of um, Austria, and then eventually, obviously, invading Poland. So he's saying that, that, that the lesson here is that there needs to be a much more robust security in those countries that would deter Putin further. So that's what he means by the 1937 moment. And we could perhaps discuss that a little bit more in a second. But I just wanted to mention a few other things in the speech um, that he said. 
I mean, some of the statistics that he cited um, are absolutely, I mean, startling uh, when one hears them articulated in this way. So he says that up to 33,000 Russians are dead, wounded, missing or captured. Um, There's a casualty rate of up to 200 per day amongst the Ukrainian defenders. 77,000 square kilometres of territory has been seized, which is 43% of the total landmass of the Baltic states. Um, he talks about f- up to 4,700 civilian dead, 8 million refugees. I mean, he just underlines, and I quote here, the visceral nature of a European land war is not just some manifestation of distant storm clouds on the horizon. We can see it now. In all my years in uniform, I haven't known such a clear threat to the principles of sovereignty and democracy and the freedom to live without fear of violence as the brutal aggression of President Putin and his expansionist ambitions. And he goes on, I believe we are living through a period in history as profound as the one that our forebears did over 80 years ago. Now, as then, our choices will have a disproportionate effect on our future. So um, really interesting um, stuff. And there's one other thing I just wanted to flag from this before we get into a discussion on it, which is where he talks about um, uh, Russian military capacity and the lessons of history there. And I quote, it is dangerous to assume that Ukraine is a limited conflict. One of its obvious lessons is that Putin's calculations do not always follow our logic. It's worth remembering that historically Russian often, Russia often starts wars badly. And because Russia wages war at the strategic, not the tactical level, its depth and resilience means it can suffer any number of campaigns, battles and engagements lost, regenerate and still ultimately prevail. So... Clearly here he's looking back at examples from the Second World War where after the launch of Operation Barbarossa in 1941, Russia was caught completely off the back foot and yet did still manage to triumph on the Eastern Front over several years. I think he's also perhaps referring here to 1812 and Napoleon's invasion, which again was um, a- another disaster. Um, so, he, But he's saying that ultimately Russia was able to come back from those because essentially they have so many resources available to them, whether they be hum- um, measured by, in terms of munitions but also and, res- and natural resources, but also manpower, that which they are willing to lose and risk lives of more so than perhaps in the West. I think I would challenge him slightly on the notion that all Russian wars have ended with them sort of having more capacity by the end. I mean, Afghanistan is the classic example of where that has not been the case. Um, But even so, I think a fascinating piece of analysis here and sort of saying, you know, that we need to think about this in the long term, that the Russian capacities may, may, may well increase um, and and that they will be willing to throw, throw more and more at this. And so as a consequence, NATO and the British Army must be prepared for that. So lots to unpack there. I'm sure you've got lots of questions, David, but I thought I'd give the whole lay of the land for you and for listeners first before we dive in. No, absolutely. I guess um, I guess what, what one of my questions is, 1937, how how useful a parallel is this? We, we do live in a different world. And if we're going to test what he's saying, surely we have to ask to what extent you know, how how is our situation now different to what they to what um, Europe faced in in the 1930s? Well, I think what's something that's very striking um, in his statement is no reference to the nuclear question. I mean, that's actually been a shift that's taken place, I think, in, in, in recent weeks. As Putin has sort of dialed down some of the rhetoric on, on the nuclear point, there seems to be this sort of assumption now that, 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 that there are perhaps certain... Uh, that the, 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 it would perhaps be conceivable that there would be some sort of limited conventional war if Russia were to um, do something stupid and evade Estonia and Latvia, um, which of course was was being talked about as a possibility if if Ukraine had been see, considered a success. Both of those being NATO powers. Um, so of course, in that sense, we are in a very different situation because I would argue that that if there would have, if were it not for the nuclear question, having learnt the lessons from the 1930s, we would have gone to war over Ukraine. I mean, we would probably have British and American soldiers on the ground, um, as well as from numerous other powers, Czech Republic, Poland, etc. Um, it has been the nuclear question that has completely changed this. And yet what's interesting is that this statement seems to make no reference to that. Um, it is as if almost we're now sort of back in, in terms of this rhetoric into the 1930s, as opposed to, um, uh, to, 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 to the more modern era, which has been completely reshaped by the fact that nuclear deterrents have meant that they've been avoiding at all costs the idea of there being a nuclear escalation. Um, but I think obviously that's not to say that we're not perhaps right to not be naive and to be expanding our military capacity 
um, in light of the invasion of Ukraine, not only because, you know, it's shown that conventional warfare can still happen on European soil, but also it's all about this matter of deterrence. You know, if you really did not have the defensive capacity um, on NATO's borders and say Putin were willing to whisk an an escalation, then clearly that would be an egregious error and increases the likelihood of a further escalation, which could then turn nuclear. So the idea, I think, here is that we're trying trying to deter that rather than these forces being created to to actually fight in a war. We're back to, to having large armies to act as a deterrent as opposed to um, to actually fighting. But I just one other thing on this, this 1930s comparison, which I think is, is, is worth debating to your question, is I had an interesting conversation. I probably should say I, I found it rather concerning conversation. But anyway, um, over the over I think it was on Friday. I was talking to a, a national um, s- security advisor. I can't really go any further into any further details than that. And we were debating this question about the future of, of Ukraine and, and Western foreign policy. And his line was 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 much more in line with with Emmanuel Macron's and, and France's, which is this idea that we cannot afford to humiliate Russia. That a nation that has humiliated history teaches us is one that comes back and and um, not only emboldens the dictator but leads them into a situation where they can you know, do commit all sorts of heinous crimes or declare wars, etc., for their own empowerment and all of these things. And he, of course, as well, talked about um, the Treaty of Versailles in 1919 and how uh, this sort of humiliation that Germany suffered is eventually what created Hitler and then eventually created the war. Um, I mean, I... <laughs> Would, would would quite fiercely challenge this notion on several fronts. I mean, the first is this idea that, of course, I would be sympathetic to the idea that, um, Russia, that, that Germany was to some extent humiliated and that Hitler was able to ride that wave. But I would say that far more significant was the Wall Street crash in 1929 and the economic implosion within Germany, which ultimately precipitated the um, uh, Hitler's rise to power. But more importantly here, there's a step, a step that's being missed. Yes, Versailles did humiliate Germany, but it didn't make war inevitable. Um, it put Hitler in power. But it was the later mistakes that led to to war in Europe. There was a crucial period. And I remember reading this in, in Niall Ferguson's um, um, War of the World, if people are interested in going into more detail into this argument, that, that it would have been possible for the Allied powers to stop Hitler in 1935. Certainly, you know, perhaps in 1937 um, were certain more... Um, I suppose one would say um, a proactive, preemptive, hawkish style foreign policy adapt, um, tactics adopted. Um, the, 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 the armies were big enough to to stop Hitler in his tracks and to to, to stop war from from escalating. So I think we are, of course, speaking as a historian, I would say we should always be trying to learn lessons from history. And clearly, this this advisor I was talking to is trying to do that and say there's a he- serious danger of, of, of it when one humiliates a, a great power. But I would say that, that in trying to cite Versailles and trying to cite Hitler, Hitler is so, for some reason as to why one shouldn't um, um, be proactive in trying to, to 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 defend against this aggression in Ukraine and be careful about about um, re- resisting as robustly as as we can uh, and not granting ter- territorial concessions. I think is is a flawed policy um, for, for for the reasons that I've just explained there. But interested to hear your thoughts, David. Well, thank you very, very much for that, Francis. I'm also very interested for anybody listening. If you if you have thoughts on this, do um, do let us know. Um, just some context for this, of course, that in in terms of this being a sort of internal British political matter, the government just seen some breaking news flagged to me by a listener from uh, Hugo Guy at the Eye that the government has abandoned man- its manifesto pledge to raise defence spending um, by zero point five percent. Boris Johnson believes it is unaffordable in the wake of the pandemic. So this does set up, I think, if you've got the army saying, "Well, we need to expand." troops and equipment and etc and the government is saying well we you know we can't afford it that's going to be an interesting debate in in days to come um we've talked a lot about history so far can we talk a little bit about history in the making joe barnes brussels correspondent you're at the nato summit in madrid what's on the agenda and what can you tell us good afternoon everyone um sorry for the technical hitches um these nato summits when they arrive and um, often when there's an american president in town we're in madrid on this occasion they Basically, they come along and they put a massive security cordon around the place, um, around the cordon, and you basically cannot move without kind of several security checks. So I've just managed to negotiate my way through there. But what we have on the cards is basically what NATO calls the most historic kind of overhaul since the end of the Cold War. Um, and so Jens Stoltenberg, Secretary General, yesterday announced that they're going to put together 
kind of a high readiness force of up to 300 kind of thousand troops and assets so that's going to involve kind of troops uh war planes uh air warships and kind of naval assets that are going to protect nato and its allies um basically from what it perceives as russian aggression they like, there are people on the eastern flank the baltic states that fear that russia could actually one day invade so um, then what else is on the agenda they're going to the uh, nato leaders of all 30 of them um, are going to talk about what more nato can do to help ukraine um and so in, unilaterally there they will look to give more weaponry and more kind of financial assistance one thing that nato leaders could uh, do is actually bring together a package of military training kind of missions to bring Ukraine's army up to NATO standard. And that is seen as kind of one of these key security guarantees moving forward to protect uh, Ukraine's future kind of Russian. Um, what is quite an interesting policy that's going to be changed. NATO currently on its eastern flank with Russia has something called a tripwire defence policy. That basically means small pockets of defence forces that are basically seen as expendable. Russia one day invades. This tripwire basically kind of stalls the Russian advance. We'll come in 180 days. We'll try and liberate uh, these uh, kind of states from Russian control. But one thing the Baltic states have already concern at and seeing the kind of tactics deployed by Russia in Ukraine is that there wouldn't be much left of kind of Tallinn, of, uh, of kind of the Latvian uh, Riga, because Vladimir Putin's and the Soviet doctrine they use basically just levels towns to the floor. It raises them to the ground. So they're worried that this 180-day gap is too little. So actually... For the first time in its history, since say the biggest kind of move since the Cold War, is that NATO is going to put a actual genuine genuine deterrent on the eastern flank. They're going to basically have forces at the ready that will not only act as a tripwire; they will actually push Russia back across the border and stop them from invading altogether. Well, thank you very much, Jay, for that. Can I just ask quickly as well, what's the latest on um, Sweden and Finland joining NATO? We know that Tur- Turkey has some reservations. Um, what can we say about the the, 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 the diplomacy around this? Okay, so um, actually what we've got for the first time today is the leaders of Finland, Sweden, uh, Turkey and Jens Stoltenberg are meeting later this afternoon. And that there is due to be, it's a rumoured kind of press conference, so th- those listening uh, tomorrow on the podcast uh, may be kind of waking up to this brilliant news that um, Finland and Sweden are allowed to join NATO, but kind of we're waiting with bated breath because this is actually like kind of real diplomacy in real time. It's happening now. Um, kind of Jens Stoltenberg yesterday when he kind of gave his first press conference to kind of open the summit and kind of set the raise, like kind of raise on it, was he poured cold water on the idea. He, he basically said, look, it's, it's, it's no guarantee that it's going to come very quickly because of the opposition uh, from Turkey and the kind of the fears that they have about Sweden and Finland's relationships with uh, terror groups, mainly the PKK. But actually, when we get leaders actually putting heads together, and, and, and when you see kind of the, the attacks on kind of the civilian population in Kiev uh, over the last few days in Kremlinshuk, then does that focus minds? Does it actually kind of lead to the idea that, come on, guys, we need to actually like butt heads together and let's get it done. Your, your, your concerns are going to be addressed, but let's at least get Finland and Sweden in the room as invitees for the summit. That's absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Joe. Francis, just wondering if you had any thoughts on this or questions for Joe while, as he's out there in Madrid. Yes, um, thanks, Joe. And I, I, I was very struck by this pledge that forces, NATO forces will in, be increased to 300,000 troops, which, of course, is a sevenfold rise. Do we know exactly where most of that will be coming from? I mean, will these be mostly American soldiers or funded by America? Or will this be more evenly spread out than that? I'm just wondering the extent to which we have the details. So the idea of this 300,000 um, troops it, to, 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 to the kind of untrained eye looks like a huge, vast number of kind of... And the big questions are over, are they going to actually be deployed on kind of the front lines? And the answer to that is no, they're not. This is basically a shopping list for the Supreme Allied Commander Europe who is the US uh, soldier, the US general, who is basically in charge of NATO's military kind of organisation. And this is just to give him a better idea of what troops and assets countries have made available to NATO at any one time and how long it will take for them to deploy. 
So the 300,000 number is not expected to be up and running until kind of well into next year. But what we will have uh, this year, and uh, from my sources tell me, is a 44,000 strong uh, force, um, which but will be ready with up to 15 days notice. So between 24 hours and 15 days notice, it can deploy anywhere in Europe to basically stop a Russian invasion or a kind of another Article 5 threat. Um, so the 300,000 will not be already at the same time. This will be kind of, there'll be rotational. Some will be sent out on kind of training exercises. But the idea is basically to increase NATO's readiness and have a bigger block of troops and assets available to it at any one time, uh, just in case kind of the worst comes to comes to fruition. Russia invades, uh, maybe China invades, another kind of another, it doesn't have, it's not solely focused at Russia, but they are the biggest kind of focus at the moment. Just on that point about Russia um, at, at versus China in the sort of geopolitical grand scheme, my understanding is America are far more concerned with China than with Russia, to your point, and because they see them as a sort of the great threat long term. I just wanted your take on uh, to what extent has the war in Ukraine underlined that China is the real threat as opposed to Russia, simply for the fact that I know that sounds counterintuitive, but bear with me because of the scale of the Russian humiliation. So, you know, there was this we've talked a lot about how there was this myth of of, of the indestructible Russian army. That is clearly not true. And and I'm not in any way undermining the, the incredible efforts of the Ukrainian forces. But it's 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 very different than a situation that one can imagine that this war would have been over even more quickly if, say, it had been American highly advanced weaponry being used by American soldiers against um, Russian tanks, etc. So what I'm saying is it's undermined this idea that, that Russia is is this perhaps great military power, um, the nuclear question aside, of course, this great power that we expected. So just wanted to hear your take, John. Do, do you get a sense that the eyes are are now more on, on on China than Russia? Or does this actually, do you not get that sense that, 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 or that is the threat much more uh, in the short term and, and looking at Putin? So very much um, all eyes are on Russia. And I don't think there's any kind of denying that, that the bulk of this summit in Madrid will be taken up by issues of kind of Russian aggression in Ukraine and then potential Russian threats on NATO's eastern flank. But what the war in Ukraine has done, and this is much the kind of the uh, delight, or well, it's probably the wrong word to use, because the, the Brits and the Americans won't be pleased with what they're seeing in Ukraine, but it has highlighted and basically developed a more hawkish attitude across NATO when it comes to security. So it has enabled kind of the Americans, and this will um, come out in the what the strategic concept is. That's the document, the 10-year planning document that NATO are going to kind of sign off on this week and they have got much tougher language on china they will be kind of labeled as a kind mm. of a systematic a systematic rival and a, and a, and a uh, to to kind of nato security which if you look back to lisbon in 2011 i believe it was the language they used for russia was a strategic rival so actually the, the language we're getting for china now is a lot tougher than uh, Russia, who was listed as a strategic partner. So actually, it has helped focus minds, and then they will. it's created an open kind of discussion about the actual concerns around China. And there's been lots of kind of backroom diplomacy of kind of tightening up the language and making sure everyone is aware of the threat that China poses. And, and that, that threat is mainly kind of hoovering up kind of Western technology companies. And basically, like Europe, became reliant and dependent on Russia for kind of energy, the US and the UK are worried that the West becomes reliant on China for technology. So for instance, 5G for for other kind of chipsets, computer sets, for military equipment perhaps. So actually this is kind of really helping focus minds and kind of bringing together the idea that Europe, America should be a lot less dependent on China in the future. A quick question from me. Um, I know we have lots of Ukrainian listeners as well. Um, for people living under the in Russian invasion, what would a what's the sort of best case scenario that could come out of this NATO meeting? Um, I think the best case scenario is going to be there's going to be lots of pledges of uh, new weapons uh, systems, and but I think actually the idea of long term training missions is is a brilliant one. So um, I was speaking to 
Ben Wallace a few weeks ago at the NATO Defence Minister Summit in Brussels. And he basically kind of come up with this idea to say, look, we can throw all of the ingredients to Ukraine that we please, but they'd be much better if they had a cookbook and a recipe and they could actually deliver a final product. So he's basically saying that we can give these brilliant Western weapons to Ukraine. If, if there's under the doctrine, which is essentially just kind of spray and pray, and kind of absolute dropping hundreds and hundreds of shells a minute or an hour on their on their targets, they're not going to be able, they're not going to have these Western weapons for that long because they just won't last that long. But what we have is these great precision weapons that can strike targets with kind of millimeters of accuracy from great distances of kind of hundreds of miles. So the better the better option is to actually train Ukrainian soldiers to bring them up to a NATO standard, and that and that's one of the best security guarantees that I think you can that you can deliver a country that's still kind of lingering in its Soviet past is to is to bring them up and develop their kind of armies, their armed forces into a modern fighting combat unit. And from what you see around the summit, do you get a sense of the of the morale? Are, are NATO dele- are the NATO delegate delegations confident about? Uh, the Ukrainian army's resistance to the Russian advance, or are, pe- are people more more um, more worried? Uh, there's 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 mixed camps to this. As we were kind of speaking, there are there are still those. And Boris Johnson went with the warning to to G, his G seven colleague not to basically push Ukraine into doing a, a dodgy and slapdash peace deal, and actually for kind of Western leaders to back Ukraine until the end, until it it like makes a decision on what it wants to do. Um, so, so there are those kind of splits. The Americans, the Brits definitely want to see a full kind of military kind of defeat for Russia. Um, actually, NATO itself, the officials there want to see that. But some some kind of allies, some member states will have different opinions. And I, I, I think in, in, in general, everyone is kind of quite buoyed. They've seen the Ukrainians do brilliantly and they, they, they have donated kind of billions of billions of pounds of weapons to their cause. And that's only going to increase. So well, what I think is um, you can look at kind of the American intelligence on this. They think actually, uh, and the UK have been saying, will Russia one day, potentially this summer, in August maybe, run out of kind of munitions and kind of shells and soldiers even? Uh, there's um, kind of some great intelligence that, and we've seen it, um, that Russia is kind of deploying kind of former retired generals on the battlefield because they're just losing too many kind of military leaders on on the field so actually there, 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 there is kind of light at the end of the tunnel but what i think most nato leaders would say is kind of let's get on with it let's let's bite down on gritted teeth let's carry on backing the ukrainians and, and actually give them a chance to win and let's not push them into a corner and allow russia to negotiate with a gun to their head thanks joe i know francis had some thoughts he wanted to jump in with uh, at this point yes yeah, so i think to joe's point about these dividing lines within the g7 on the on the ukrainian military situation i think it all boils down to interpreting how one interprets the current situation of the war and the likely trajectory of it which of course we've spoken about since the very beginning on this podcast so I, i'm conscious that i'm sort of repeating things that we've said before but with perhaps some 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 more interesting sort of insights in the in in, in just the last few days so as I say, that the central challenge here is, is does an attritional war, aka the kind of one that we are seeing now, favour Ukraine or Russia? And it seems that there are different perspectives on this within the G7, just as there are amongst military experts. So you've got some who argue that an attritional war favours Russia because obviously it has such enormous reserves of, uh, of 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 resources that it can call upon, and particularly in terms of of men being conscripted, um, vast factories and things could be turned around to to, to churning out more weaponry, etc. And those who argue that in that context, an attritional war does favour um, the the a, a Russia at least being able to drag this out long enough that, that perhaps some of the, and this is certainly what Putin is hoping, uh, the, the Western resolve to continue resisting as, as the sort of costs mount up, the food crisis mounts up, cost of living and everything else, um, 
that this will ultimately lead to to there being concessions granted and Putin can claim some sort of territorial victory. And then you've got those who argue that actually nutritional war favours the Ukrainians um, because they are will be continuing to receive up-to-date weaponry, that they will have morale on their side. I mean, I've already cited in the past some very interesting statistics about the self-belief amongst Ukrainians, which has never dipped about absolute, you know, in believing in absolute victory below, I believe, about 70 percent, um, which is extraordinarily high given the absolutely horrific situation that has taken place in that country. And so evidently, um, you know, when measured by morale, when measured by sort of the the, the attrition rates, certainly as they were in the early stages of the war, which were lower than they are now, but even so, they're they're perhaps not as high as they could be, given the the tactical adeptedness of the Ukrainian forces. Um, I think that there is a strong argument that an attritional war favours them in the long run, because just purely, you know, Russian military capability was already suffering so greatly and had they not adapted their cha- their their tactics in the last few weeks, then I think there was they were seriously facing a complete implosion, and they had no choice but to fight a more defensive war. Um, and some interesting analysis online um, by Jennifer Caff- um, Caffarella, who's the chief of staff at the Institute for the Study of War in Washington, and she, in her view, which is echoes the remarks of Phillips O'Brien, who we often cite, who's a military expert, who we often cite on this podcast and writes for us sometimes, this idea that actually, if one assesses this. Uh, in the context of what's currently going on, she argues that this is a nutritional war situation that we are facing and that does favour the Ukrainians. But it, the, the, the key point is that the, the, and the key challenge for them, which is different to what we've seen in, in recent weeks, is that they will now have to change to an offensive stri- style tactics that the Russians are effectively trying to hold on to their territory they've taken in the Donbass. Um, and uh, it will be a very different type of war um, when the Ukrainians will actually be trying to push them back rather uh, in an aggressive manner, which obviously always costs more um, in terms of resources and manpower. And that is the central question is, are they going to receive the support from NATO? Is morale within NATO going to be strong enough that it is willing to provide that? It would seem from the noises coming out of the G7 um, that, that they that they are, but that was not necessarily certain a fortnight ago and so I think we've definitely seen a shift and I think it's just worth under, you know, underlining the extent to which this, this goes against the, the orthodox view that was present in amongst those leaders, particularly Emmanuel Macron um, prior to the conflict beginning there's been some very interesting excerpts of, of actual um, dialogues that he had with Putin released in a French documentary today where you know you, you've got Macron saying to Putin you know what are your intentions what do you plan to do there's still a way out we, we can we can get you in a summit with Joe Biden and you know Putin effectively sort of waving this away and batting this away and and yet Macron still despite all of this was 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 saying that um, even until a few weeks ago that, that, that Russia can't be humiliated that concessions must be granted and yet it would appear that G7 has repudiated that view and so it would appear that for now the p- British perspective has won out but whether that will be the case long long term I think remains to be seen Yeah so just to jump in on what you were saying there Francis I was speaking to a, a former American diplomat uh, yesterday on the fringe of the NATO summit um, and say this chap he used to work uh, with Joe Biden with uh, Anthony Blinken than in Obama's White House. And he was saying that the tactics probably just aren't sufficient. There doesn't seem to be a general actually put this war to it. What he's doing with kind of a slow trickle of weaponry is allowing kind of slow war to develop. It's, it's not giving Ukraine the genuine capabilities to drive at Russia and kind of push them back, push their lines of defence back. It's basically creating a stalemate. And what he suggested was actually Joe Biden should send a message to Vladimir Putin or, or for a Boris Johnson, Emmanuel Macron, whoever he, he decides, is to say, look, Vladimir, you can start withdrawing your troops from Ukraine, pumping your tens of billions, not just one billion at a time, we're going to put tens of billions in. We're going to actually give you one. We're going to 150 kind of multi-launch rocket systems we're gonna we're gonna get more tanks and stuff over to them and actually give them the capabilities to drive you back and that just seems to be an idea that maybe and this could be something that western leaders and nato could actually kind of have a discussion about 
is are their tactics right? Are they working um, as a genuine unit when it comes to kind of giving Ukraine the capabilities to kind of end the war? That's absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much, Joe. And thank you, Francis. I think we're just starting to come to the end of our time today. Um, can I get both of your final thoughts? And Joe, first of all, just can you just sketch out for us what's going to happen over today and tomorrow? What are the really big uh, things that, that our listeners should be looking to lo- looking to uh, pay attention to that will come from the NATO summit? OK, so today is the opening of the NATO summit. And I think the, 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 the kind of the big, the big thing, as I, I kind of sketched out earlier, is the talks between Turkey, Finland, Sweden and NATO Sec Gen uh, Jens Stoltenberg. So um, within uh, an hour, uh, maybe we could, there's kind of rumour of a, a Jens Stoltenberg press conference. Um, could he announce something positive? I've heard slight whispers it might be positive, but then others are kind of less willing to, to commit to that. So tomorrow morning when kind of our podcast listeners tune in, we could actually have a, an enlarged NATO of 32 kind of alliance members. Um, that would be today's kind of big point. Uh, and then it's just leaders gathering tonight for a kind of a dinner, which is a tradition of opening NATO summits. They're having a, a dinner with King Philippe, the Spanish kind of royal. Uh, and then tomorrow and Thursday is um, that's really sketching out kind of what's going to be happening in terms of NATO posture on the eastern flank. That's when they'll these leaders will agree to drop the tripwire doctrine and actually put in a kind of a full blooded defence to deter any Russian aggression on NATO's borders. And we're actually we might get we might get more details. You'll get more details on this three hundred thousand troops and where they where they come from and how how ready they will be, and will they be deployed? And I think one thing to look um, at Boris Johnson while he's over here, he's going to announce um, kind of Britain's commitment to reinforcing Estonia's defences. Currently, we have about fifteen hundred uh, troops there as part of a, an enhanced forward presence through NATO, but there's talk that we could change that to a brigade size. Um, which could contain 3,000 to 5,000 troops. Might they all be posted in Estonia at one time? We don't know. They could be. We could basically have a reserve set home in Britain that are constantly training and ready to deploy to Estonia within a couple of hours if Russia kind of does the worst. And that's, that's I think, uh, the things we should kind of look out for as we go along through this week. Well, thank you very much, Joe. Um, your time is hugely appreciated, as are your thoughts. Um, look, looking forward to what happens to hearing more about what happens in the NATO summit. Uh, Francis Sternley, would you like the final word? Well, I spoke a lot about the remarks of the Chief of Defence Staff earlier, and there was just one other thing that he, he said in his remarks that I thought w- was interesting, and I'll, I'll quote it in full before perhaps making a, a comment on it. We don't yet know how the war in Ukraine will end, but in most scenarios, Russia will be an even greater threat to European security after Ukraine than it was before. The Russian invasion has reminded us of the time-honoured maxim that if you want to avert conflict, you better be prepared to fight. I just think that's obviously clearly the the, 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 the orthodoxy of that, that, that last point as we've spoken all about today. And so I think it summarises the nato perspective very well but the reason i also cite that is i think he's right to say that it is likely that whatever the situation with russia there is going to be increasing volatility most domestically within that country but also threatened sort of internationally with its 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 former satellite states from the soviet union days we are not going to be in i don't think the europe uh, that, that we knew prior to the Ukraine war starting again for a very, very long time. We must accept that Russia has taken a path here that may well take decades to extradite it from, even if in the worst, the, the best case scenario where Putin is humiliated by this war and were dethroned by somebody, the likelihood is that with the apparatus that he has made in that state, that it will be another similar style leader that would succeed him. There has been a catalogue of errors, foreign policy errors within the West that has got us to this point. And we have to completely think about this in a more long term strategic manner if there is to be success long term, not only against Russia, but also emergent autocratic threats around the world. And I do sometimes worry that there is still a mentality around Ukraine that sees this in a short term context, that if we can just sort of stop the tanks from rolling across Ukraine, if we can keep Russia contained, that somehow we can go back to the way things were 
prior to the invasion and that the great sort of age of globalization can resume once again and Russia can gradually be brought back into the fold and all will be well. I think this has completely changed the cultural, historic and political map of the world in ways that we have yet to really appreciate. And until we do, then I think we're still very much at risk. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash audio. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app and leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly with us by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, and today on Twitter, Sophie Coe.